Welcome to The Selling Show, where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. Well, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to have my friend on, Mr. Henry DeVries, CEO and co-founder of Indie Books International and weekly business development columnist for Forbes.com. Hello, Henry. David, so great to talk business development with you. You're one of the great minds on the subject. Uh, So good to be with you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Clearly, we have a mutual admiration society going on here, and you're about to find out why. So, Henry, I know you have a new book, which I am super excited about. It's called Rainmaker Confidential. The subtitle is How Top Professionals Make Smart Business Development Investments of Their Time, Treasure, and Talent. So, tell us about where that book came from, and maybe give us a little background to kind of give us the the kind of what the business is, what the empire looks like, and how you came to do what you do, and then we'll launch into the genesis of the book. Well, thank you for asking. So let's go back in time. We're going to go back to the dark days of Friday the 13th, March 2020, to be exact. And as we know, the, the world that we knew shut down, the whole world shut down I got curious, what were the top rainmakers, the people who make it rain at top professional service firms going to do? So I launched into a year-long research project and I interviewed them, some for my column in Forbes, others just to get them in round tables. And I wanted to know what were they gonna spend less on, less money, less energy on? What were they gonna spend more money and more energy on? And what was their go-to strategy that was working? And a picture started to emerge. And that's where I thought, I need to share this with the world of professionals and consultants and entrepreneurs, people who are having to make it rain uh, despite not being able to be in person. I built this business being on an airplane. I'm in the Million Mile Club for American Airlines. I'm lifetime gold. and. I haven't made a plane trip, well, except one. I've made one plane trip in the last two years. So how did we continue to grow the business? We started Indie Books in 2014. And I say we, my partner is best-selling author, business coach, Mark LeBlanc. And we said, let's start a publishing firm for professionals and consultants and coaches. So we started Indie Books International. We've grown 500% since that first year. And despite COVID, we've uh, grown 30% in the last two years. So what were we doing that was right? So that went into the book too. Very nice. Tell us a little bit about kind of just the current state of the empire. What are the different revenue streams in your business? The different things that you sell? Break that down for us a little bit. Thanks. Two main revenue streams, preparation of books, publication of books, and promotion of books. So I help people prepare books either as a developmental editor or as a ghostwriter, sometimes a co-author of a book. And I have done more than 300 business books in the last 10 years as one of those three roles. And then the publication of the book getting the book out there, getting a book that people will love, not just saying, here's a template or here's what to do, or we actually work with them every step of the way. And I bake marketing right into the book. I wrote the book, marketing with a book, not marketing a book, marketing with a book. So our studies show if you do what we say on the promotion end, you can get an ROI of 400 to 2,000%. So if people spend oh, I don't know, ten dollars to $20,000 getting a book done, independently publishing it, marketing, they can get additional fees as a speaker, as a consultant, as a trainer. They're getting anywhere from 
40,000 to 250,000. We have several people who are on record to say we've made them a million dollars thanks to our book and our training. So we do the promotion. Uh, now we've opened that up to, we don't take everybody, David, but if we agree to promote you, you can be in our promotion programs that help attract clients and can get that ROI of the 400 to 2,000%. I love that for so many reasons. And this is something that I think not enough entrepreneurs, not enough executives who look into publishing realize. Two ways to make money from a book, and I'd love you to talk about both of them. Right. Number one is you make money from the book. Number two is you make money because of the book. Dip into that for a little bit. Certainly. Well, if you're with a traditional publisher like David and I are with, you get like a buck 50 per book. And they paid you in advance on that. And it's hard to see any more return from a traditional publisher. But you're able to say, you know, you're published by McGraw-Hill or Simon & Schuster or Penguin or whatever. There's value to that. But with an indie book, the economics are flipped. Instead of getting 15% of the proceeds of the book, you get 85% of the proceeds of the book. And if they were counting on you to sell 10,000 copies, you'll make a heck of a lot more if you get 85% of that rather than 15. So that's some of the economics where people do make money from the book. For most people, and I've used your language, David, I tell them it's a self-liquidating marketing investment. Your money that you make from selling a thousand copies of the book will pay for all your marketing expenses and publishing expenses. So then you get into the black. But the real money is what happens as a result of the book, shining a spotlight on that book that reflects on you and your work. And that's where people get 4X to 20X ROI. And that's what we've measured. It's what happens as a result of the book, not getting the book published. I say publishing the book is the starting line, not the finish line. We help get people on that race through weekly training, through quarterly retreats, through annual meetings, and we get them booked on podcasts, on stages, virtual, and, you know, knock on wood, we're getting back to some live stages. I'm getting tired, David, of learning the letters in the Greek alphabet. Yes. uh, Yeah. Also, I, I have to warn you, I've tested positive for cabin fever, so I'm, I'm not really liking lockdown, but okay, we'll get back out there again. But I'm on podcasts every month. I'm giving virtual speeches every month. And that's what gets people to have conversations with me. And the conversations are what lead them to either hiring us for preparation, publication, or promotion. Totally fantastic. Well, our next little segment here, Henry, is rolling up our sleeves and getting kind of going behind the curtain, if you will. Nitty gritty sales war stories. Kind of talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. Okay. My first question with this is kind of a fun question, and people sometimes share very surprising stories. Can you think of a time where you totally thought that you blew a sale? You said, Oh, well, this is over. I blew it. This person's never coming back. And either that prospect totally did not perceive any gaffe or any problem. Or it's somehow you rescued the sale. You saved the situation. The client ended up buying anyway. So think of it in terms of a sales fumble. You recovered. It wasn't perceived by the prospect as a fumble. Any sale that you've won that was particularly surprising to you? Let's go back in time to when I was president of an advertising and PR agency. And one of the things I did to feed the funnel is I taught at a a university, the uh, University of California, San Diego, in their extended studies program. So I was adjunct faculty. And one of my students asked me to come in and pitch their account. And she talked to me for an hour, and I understood nothing about what this business was or what they did. And then at the end, she said, our current agency is Manning, Selvage, and Lee. Well, that was the first thing I understood because they only handled million dollar accounts. So I said, this sounds great. Give me a week and I'll be ready with a presentation. So I researched everything for a week. 
was ready for a presentation and she brought her boss in and her boss was this bulldog, aggressive kind of person. And everything I presented, he challenged me on. Well, the other members of my team shut down. They like, you know, they were afraid to talk to this guy, but I just stood toe to toe and answered everything and went on and every idea was challenged. And then I felt bad afterwards. I thought like, wow, I blew that. So I called her up to apologize for somehow misreading everything and doing it wrong. And I called her up. I said, hi, Dory, it's Henry. She goes, thank you for calling. That went really well, don't you think? So I do a lot of improv here. And I said, yes, I do. She goes, I can't tell you anything right now, but we're going to have a call with some good news real soon. And that's what it was like to work with him for the next five years. His modus operandi was to challenge you and see if you backed down. <laughs> so if I may go on, we get the account, you know, that we're on, we're on 90 day secret double probation. So I'm doing all these things right. And then the day of, you have to come in for the account review with Mr. Hard Rear End. Okay, so... I go work out at the gym that morning before the meeting and I'm, I'm not a fit man, but I'm wearing spandex and all this. And there was a, an aerobics class and all this. And I go to the locker to change into my business suit and I had left it at home and there is no way to go home, get the suit and make it on time to the appointment. So I go three options. One, call up and say, I'm sick, can't make it. This is the only day he can be in town to do it. Not good. You know, two, say, I'm going to be late and go get the suit, come back in the suit. Not good. Number three, just go. So I go to their corporate headquarters and I walk in in spandex and a sweatshirt and my, you know, button down, you know, account executives with me and I'm the boss, but she's going like, Oh my God, you know, what have you done? I said, just come on into the meeting. We go there. Okay, well, let's review this. And I said, let's review. And we go down through everything. He never brings up how I'm dressed. So I don't. And I'm just like total confidence in there. I had studied theater in college. I was wanting to be a writer, but I had to go through the acting classes to write for the stage and screen. One of the exercises was, you had to lay down on the ground and somebody had to stand over you and you had to dominate the conversation from that position of weakness. So I just like, we do a lot of improv here. Here we go. And we get the contract for the whole year and everything's good. Later I asked him, I said, why didn't you say something? He said, I was waiting for you to bring it up. And since you didn't bring it up, I wasn't going to bring it up. And we just talked business. So you can save it. It's never over till it's over to quote uh, baseball great Yogi Berra. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, that's so many lessons in there, right? About assumptions and about, oh my God, I have to say something. It's like, no, you don't. I have to acknowledge this weakness. No, you don't. I have to say how embarrassed I am. No, you don't. In fact, not only you not have to say how embarrassed you are, you don't even need to be embarrassed. Right. So it's what are we projecting on the prospects? What are we projecting onto the marketplace that doesn't exist there at all? And sometimes our biggest sales obstacle is literally between our ears. Yes. That boss was Jewish. And by the way, he said, I just figured this guy has chutzpah, which yes. if you need to translate it, that's gumption if you're from the Midwest. So I had grit, gumption, and chutzpah. Very, very nice. Holy smoke, so much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. Well, let's go to the other side, different kind of story. And I know disappointing kind of story. You're doing everything right. It is a textbook sale from initial contact, almost the signed contract. 
you're feeling good, buying signals left and right. And for some reason, they don't buy. It was a sales story of defeat pulled from the jaws of victory. For whatever reason, it turns into a no. You know, we talk about this, Henry. The operation was a huge success, but the patient died. Anything to share? Did you have a story like this and any advice about that? We're back in time at the agency. And there's an account for the advertising and marketing for a historic hotel that opens in San Diego. They took two historic hotels, took them apart brick by brick, then reassembled 160,000 bricks to create this turn of the century gas lamp era hotel. I just love history. It was just a dream. And I had done a favor. I pulled a thorn out of the paw of the developer's wife. So we had an inside track with that and organized the team, made the presentation very creative, very great. And it's awarded to the competitor. Said, you did great, but you know we just like them better. And now the rest of the story. So he had taught me once a valuable lesson, which happened at the end of this story. I'll give you the moral. So I was reading uh, different publications and I thought, oh, this publication would be perfect for them to pitch an article to. So I sent him a letter and here's how you can pitch this publication to cover the hotel. And then there was another thing that came through the convention as visitors bureau. And I thought, oh, this would be good for them. And I sent them that you could tie in with these people and do it. We didn't get the account, mind you, but I'm sending him ideas every week for a month. And he calls me in and he says, the other agency stuttered. They stammered. They didn't know how to get started. You didn't get the account and you kept promoting us. He says, I'm going to give you the lesson that I've learned in this business that's been the secret of my success. If you never quit, you never lose. He said, you refuse to quit. So it didn't mean me saying you didn't get the account, but you just that rolled off you like water off a duck. You just kept coming. And that's my lesson for everybody. If you don't quit, you never lose. And wow. it's great to be number two. I could have said, you know, how dare you make us spend all this money pitching your account and leading us on? No, No. it's just like, it's the godfather. It's not personal. It's business, Sonny. Now, actually, it's always personal, but let's go with that movie line. It's not personal. It's just business. Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's dip in. Speaking of just business, let's dip in to some of the ideas in Rainmaker Confidential. I know people are just dying to get their hands on this book as they should be. And they should just, they shouldn't be dying. They should just get the book. So Rainmaker Confidential, that's where you want to look for in your favorite place, wherever books are sold. Let's talk about prospecting. Rainmakers and prospecting, I think, talk about oil and water and, you know, rolling off your back like a duck. There is this myth that high status, consultants, coaches, professionals, rainmakers, if you will, the moment that they initiate contact with a prospect that they do not yet have a relationship with, all of a sudden, they're cold calling spammers, they're idiots, they come across as needy, they come across as desperate, they come across as weak, they come across as having way too much time on their hands. They give up all of their status, They give up all of their position. They give up all of their authority. True, false, or set us straight, what did you find in your research and what is in the fantastic book about rainmakers plus prospecting? A big aha for you. But first, I got to go to the table to bring the prop. I forgot the prop. Got to get the prop. Got to get the prop. Here we go. Okay. It It looks like a Trojan horse. This is the best strategy that our research uncovered. And it went by different names. Uh, A podcaster by the name of Stephen Wozner, he called it the Trojan horse. And I think that's the best name for it. So here, if you remember your Greek mythology, 
The Trojan Wars, so the Greeks had invaded Troy. It was about recapturing the king's wife who was kidnapped. And then the Greeks had an unsuccessful siege. And then they packed everything up, made a big show of getting on boats and going back to Greece. And when the leaders of Troy came out the next day, they found a big wooden horse. And it was said that this was a tribute to the gods of Troy. Well, I mean, I was raised by people who weren't always on the right side of the tracks, let's say, and I'm suspicious of everything, but I don't know. These Trojan leaders went, well, well, if it's a gift for our gods, I guess we should wheel it in and take it to the temple. So they wheeled this in, not checking to see if the thing was full of Greek soldiers, which it was. When they went to sleep at night, the Greek soldiers come out, open the gates. Meanwhile, the ships turned around in the night and they invade and they sack Troy. Okay, so what does this have to do, Henry, with business development? It has to do with a gift first. So Bob, one of the people in our study, Bob worked with medium-sized companies, 100 to 500 million. So he has to come into the CEO for that. So does he cold call CEOs? No. Does he send them a letter? You should hire me. I'm great. No. Bob contacts the CEOs and says, I'm looking for successful CEOs of companies in the 100 to $500 million range to include in my new study, my new book on the subject. So he got in there and many agreed to the appointments. He asked them very intelligent questions, promised that they would get the first peek at the study. So his whole plan is once the book comes out, oh, think of the clients I will get. He started getting clients when he was doing the interviews. What else are you finding out there, they would ask. And what is this? And what do you think that? So he was forming relationships by first giving. He was giving them valuable information, how they compared to their peers. Bob didn't say, well, here's what IBM's doing. Or here, by the way, IBM is not lower than 500 million. He, he, he's, but he's not giving them by name. He's saying, this is what I'm finding out there. And in general, these are the trends. So several hire him for six-figure consulting contracts before he gets the book published. He includes over 100 companies in his study. The book comes out, and through those relationships with those CEOs, and CEOs move every 36 months. So there's this new company they're at, and maybe they have new challenges, and Bob continues to get work from that. Doesn't have to be a book. But if you're thinking, hey, Henry, isn't that what you did with Rainmaker Confidential? Get away, kid, you bother me. Yes, <laughs> that was the strategy for the book. So how are we getting hired by these top professionals and consultants to do their books? Well, they met us when we interviewed them. And I put them in Forbes.com. Forbes.com, they pay me to write five columns a month. I find legitimate people, but I'm forming relationships with people because I gave them exposure in Forbes.com. I do a weekly podcast now. I'm forming relationships by putting people on the podcast. So my mom, who was a waitress from New York, she would describe it as, hey, you got to give before you get. So you got to give before you get to form yeah. relationships. Otherwise, you're just a, a taker. Hi, will you meet with me? Will you hear a pitch from us? Will you do the, the take, take, take? Give, give, give. Generosity. The scriptures say one gives generously and ends up with more. King Solomon was my uh, writer on that one. So wisest person who ever lived. So you want to be generous in giving away valuable gifts. The most valuable gift you can give away is competitive intelligence. Because every CEO, every C-level executive, every business owner is worried about how do we compare to the competition? Have they figured it out and we don't know it? Worse than getting behind. Are we going to look bad when people found out that we didn't know that? It was like the days when I had that agency. We didn't have a fax machine. So one day somebody said, fax that over to me. 
And I said, right away, go buy a fax machine. <laughs> it's like, because I didn't want to look like a poser or a wannabe. Absolutely. Wow. So again, so much rich, juicy meat there. I want to go back to a couple of points and underline and emphasize what I just heard you say. Number one, it might be, what, six months that we're working on a book-ish? Sure. But if we do what you just talked about, which is use the book as a collecting prospect stories, competitive intelligence, interviews as a marketing strategy, quote unquote, we can start to reap those benefits long before the book is published because you're having conversations with people who are in your target market. You're intentionally developing relationships, adding value, intentionally befriending this next crop of people who you want to be your prospects. And those conversations can develop and will develop and do develop into business long before, months and months before the book is ever in hand. Yes, will you publish your book? You will with Henry, if you're smart. You will have a book product in your hand, but the relationships that led you to create that book will pay off long before the book is published, correct? That's all correct. And if you notice, you're being humble. Your fingerprints are all over this strategy. When we were in our mastermind together, we talked about this and came up with the embedded compliment Subtitle. That's right, exactly. How top professionals. So when I'm interviewing you, well, that means you're a top professional. Well, yes, I am. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How stupid professionals blow business development bills. Can we interview you for right. that? Right. Oh, I so was let's... on a podcast recently, David. It was great called Lead Balloon. And Adweek named it the number one marketing podcast of the year. But you have to be willing to go on and talk about. One of your biggest mistakes, we know you're great. You know, you've written 14 business books and you ran an ad age 500 agency. Great. But we need to know about, okay, when did it all go to poop? When did the yes. hit the fan? Anyway, so the exactly. compliment, David Newman, thank you for that strategy. Well, no, you're welcome. And I, it's a brilliant implementation, right? The, the strategies are not worth anything. The strategies you implement are the ones that are worth the gold. Yes, I know, terrific episode here, but have you seen our latest web training? Oh my goodness, pop over there right now, or as soon as you're done listening to this episode, it's doitmarketing.com slash webinar. See you over there, back to the good stuff. Let me also ask you, Henry, about follow-up, and yes. specifically even yes, this kind of follow-up, because it's a delicate balance, isn't it, between bait and switch, because we never want to be seen as like bait and switch, but we're genuinely, authentically befriending these people. We're genuinely, authentically adding value to them and their company and their business and their career. If they haven't brought it up yet, and sometimes they do, they say, Henry, you know what? This is so funny. I was thinking about publishing a book. In fact, I have half of the book written. Could you possibly help me? Ding, ding, ding. They bring it up first. You win. Yeah. If they don't bring it up, but you still think, man, I could really help this person. I could really help this company. I could really help them with the services that I offer. How do we sort of hint and nudge our way into that conversation? Or is it more of a direct, hey, at this point, we're friends. We've been going back and forth for six, seven or eight weeks. I have an idea. Let me help you with this. Yeah. Is it direct? Is it indirect? What are the subtleties to that pivot into the conversation if they don't bring it up before you do? There are two schools of thought. So one school of thought is you say, would you like to know how I help companies like you? That's the assertive, aggressive approach, and I don't recommend it. I grew up on a horse ranch. This is a carrot. If you wanted the horse to come up with a, to eat a carrot, you didn't chase the horse around the corral with a carrot. I got a carrot. I got a carrot. You want a carrot? Now, certainly there are some abundance mentality horses that would come up to you, but most horses are scarcity mentality. You put the carrot in your hand, you hold it out, you let them come up to it. So it's the same sort of thing. I just keep giving. Just keep giving deposits in the paper bank. The story of if you never quit, you never lose 
is a story of I just kept giving. And don't know if that would ever pay off, but call it karma, call it kismet, call it the law of reciprocation, call it what you will. It was going to benefit me because if it didn't benefit me with that CEO, somebody would say, oh boy, I need a creative uh, you know, guy to he'd say, I know a guy. My business has been built on the four magic words in the English language. I know a guy. So people say, oh, I had one the other day. So it's, you know, there are a lot of shysters. There are a lot of scam artists. There's a lot of crooks in this publishing game. They say, I need somebody honest who's not a crook. I know a guy. Call Henry DeVries. And Very nice. 75% of our business right now, David, is from referrals. And we're getting people to come back for multiple books. Now, I always thought it would be one and done. You know, I thought, oh, I failed in creating a business because I won't have repeat customers. Nope, I didn't fail at all. I've got repeat customers and I've got advocates out there who are sending people our way. Absolutely. Talk about one or two more either surprising ideas or ideas that worked so well that most rainmaking professionals forgot them. And you found as you were writing Rainmaker Confidential that you know what? These totally work in 2022. These totally work in this crazy upside down world that we're emerging into. Anything surprising or anything in the category of everything old is new again? Oh, one surprise for me was a focus group we did with business owners, C-level executives who hire consultants and professionals and what they said about them. One, they said, you all sound the same. You all say how many years you've been doing it and how great you are and how your people make the difference. And we're actually laughing behind your back when you make those statements. We won't laugh to your face, but we, we oh, another one oh, said that. And you know what you're the worst at? And I said, what? And he goes, talking about money. I said, explain, what do you mean? He says, oh, professionals are the worst to talking about money. They don't want to talk about money. They avoid the subject. You know, they look at their shoes. I said, I don't fully understand. Explain. He goes, well, it's like if you went to a restaurant and they didn't have a menu. And you'd say, can I have a menu? And they go, well, we don't have a menu. What we like to do is ask some questions. And you go, well, like what kind of questions? Well, first question is, what type of food are you interested in? And I said, I don't know, maybe chicken. And they said, oh, there's a lot that goes into chicken. Mind if we ask you a few follow-up questions? What has been your experience with chicken before? Do you have a chicken budget? What's your chicken budget? If I could solve all your chicken challenges, what would that look like? He said, and then they want to go away for a week and come back with a proposal for a chicken dinner. So I keep this on my desk. No chicken conversations. It's a you chicken. Need to have so, a menu. So I love this. Let's say we're having a real deal conversation with a prospect. Yeah. And I always recommend that people talk money early and often. Uh, is the approach... Well, Bob, you know, right now, I don't know exactly what it is that we're doing together, but it's going to be somewhere between 5K and 50K. Is that in the range that you were looking to invest? Do you put really broad bookmarks in there or what's the best way to get that chicken off the table? Yeah. Yes, and I give ranges of X to 2X. Henry, we'd like to hire you as a speaker. I said, oh, well, my fee range is five to $10,000. Handful of variables, if you're interested, happy to talk you through that. Oh, publishing a book, ten dollars to $20,000, depending on bells and whistles, um, happy to talk you through the variables. It's always X to 2X. Yeah, you know, that's really good. Because it's specific enough to put their mind at ease that, okay, well, we're in the right ballpark or we're even in the right section of the right ballpark. Right. But it still gives you flexibility for upselling, cross-selling, et cetera. Which is my next question. In your Rainmaker research, one of the things that I believe, and I'm sure you, you've you seen lots of flavors of this with your clients and the folks that you mentor and consult with, someone shows up, says, Henry, we need a speech. The worst thing you could do is immediately get busy selling them a speech because maybe the problem is much deeper, much larger, and there could be a much bigger opportunity there. Without playing the chicken game, and that was hysterical, by the way, I totally, as soon as you take out consulting, you put in chicken, you can see how ridiculous that approach is. 
So not counting the chicken, how do we also avoid the problem of putting on a Band-Aid when what they really need is open heart surgery, but they ask for a Band-Aid, we say, hey, Band-Aids are between five and 10K. Well, here's what you have to understand. Put yourself in their shoes. So they don't really know how to work this. They're trying the best. They don't have a process and they'll bring something up and I'll say, great, I'm happy to talk about that. Do you mind if I ask you just a few questions to get some clarity? And then I'm happy to tell you everything I know. I'll be an open book. You know, we can talk about money and timing and all those things. I'll answer every question you have. Well, sure. Everybody says, yeah. So the, here's your four questions, everybody. What's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish with this speech or this book or whatever? Not for the reader or the listener, but what's the end goal? Oh, you know, I want more credibility in the marketplace. I want more impact and influence. I want more clients. Okay, got it. Okay, next thing is assets. Okay, what assets do you have to accomplish this? And I don't mean money. I mean intellectual property or things you've tried. So get them to say, oh, well, we did this, we did that, we did this other thing. And acknowledge that, oh, those are all good things. Those are all, oh. or I also say, sometimes I can help you uncover some hidden assets. So I'll ask them some follow-up questions and they'll say, oh yeah, I have done that. Or, I have that. Said, okay, well, those are all assets we can use. Third question is, what are your roadblocks? There's a reason you came to talk to me about this. What's the roadblock? David, I used to show how smart I was. And I would tell people, because I, after 300 books, I, I know the roadblocks. But I got better when I got dumb and just like, what are the roadblocks? And I'll say, you know, the roadblock would never stop someone like you, David Newman. You'd find a way over it, through it, around it, up it. But what are they? Well, they're going to say the same basic things. They're going to say things about time, money, and knowledge. And you go, okay, yeah, those are roadblocks. Fourth question, would you like to know how others have gotten from where you are to where you want to go? I'm not asking him, would you like to know how you can work with me? I'm telling them a couple of stories about somebody like them. Oh, well, let me tell you about uh, Bill Woodich had the same problem. He's a multimillionaire in Orange County, but didn't get what he wanted in life. Or, well, let me tell you about Penny Reed, you know, who was uh, living in Memphis, Tennessee in an 800 square foot apartment, had a stack of bills and didn't know how she was going to pay him. Okay, little story. The stories prove you know how to take people from where these people are to where they want to go. They gave you the instructions in the first three answers. So you paint that picture. And then what I say is, do you have any other questions? And occasionally people say, nope, that's good. That's great. I got it. Which tells me, one, they're too frightened of what it's going to take to do this. Or they think they don't have the money. What they don't have is the knowledge of how to get the money. But that's another call and story. But the ones who say, yeah, they're like, uh, how long does it take? How much does it cost? Does it come in red? <laughs> Can I have a gift wrap? You know, buying signal questions. And you, you answer all those. And then I have a discussion document. It has a menu with options. Prospects love options. Yeah. It, the option is not, do you want to work with me? Yes or no. That's like the note in a homeroom. Do you want to date David? Yes, no. I'll tell him at lunch. <laughs> it's like, no. It's like, you know, for you could go platinum, you could go gold, you could go silver. Here's what those look like. I love it. Really, really great. Well, Henry, you have dropped so many gems. People will absolutely need to rewind, re-listen to this entire interview. And when they do, they're going to come away with the conclusion, I need to connect with this guy. I need to talk to this guy. How can people get connected and stay connected to more Henry DeVries brilliance? Do we have a resource? Do we have a gift? Do we have some kind of download? Tell us where to get in touch with you. Tell us how to get a copy of Rainmaker Confidential, where it's available, URLs, bonuses, goodies, whatever you got. Where can we send people? And by the way, all of these will be in the show notes right below this episode. I send out for free a weekly business development tip. You just go to Indie Books International. That's Indie, I-N-D-I-E, books, B-O-O-K-S, I-N-T-L.com. 
and just sign up for the weekly tips. We don't share the list. We don't spam you. You'll get a free tip every week. If you contact me by email, henry at indiebooksintl.com, my free gift is, if you mention David Newman, I will spend up to 45 minutes with you, no cost strategy session, no selling zone. I won't sell you, but I'll be generous in information. I've written different books and monographs. And if that's appropriate, I'll send you a $20 book as a gift from me. And then you can always go to amazon.com and buy any of my 14 books. David, my books are my children. I can't tell you which one is my favorite, but like my children, I expect them to take care of me in my old age. Excellent point. Excellent point. I will tell you that I have been receiving Henry's weekly tip for years. They are uniformly valuable, uniformly insightful, and uniformly actionable. And I cannot wait to get my hands on Rainmaker Confidential as well. Brilliant, brilliant interview today, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you for being on with us. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thank you for shining a spotlight on my work. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.